Hey everybody, welcome back to The Tasting Room. He's Austin. I'm John. This is take two because we just went halfway through this without me hitting record on the microphones. Welcome back, everyone. Thank <laughs> hey, you so much. Yeah. And I am Austin McRoy, the master yes. brewer of Cabin Boys he Brewery. Is. And I'm John Moss, partner at Grassfire Creative, which is the studio in which we are sitting, one of our two or three studios. Yeah. Um, so this is, so episode zero was a, hey, I'm Austin, I'm John. Nice Hello. to meet you. Here's what we're going to do. So this is episode one, Colin Sato from uh, Kitchen at Vintage, Vintage Wine Bar, which if you haven't been downtown, fantastic place to go just have a glass of wine. Oh, my period. It's, like the, it's super great. The feel is like almost like a swanky New York hotel. Like it's fantastic. Yeah. Way different than the feel that they had when they were over at 18th and Boston, which was like your grandma's house, mismatched furniture and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, I actually never went there. You never did? Mm-mm. It was literally no. mismatched furniture. Oh, so it's way different now. Um, I like this vibe better. And then obviously while you're there, you have to eat some of Colin and his crew, their food. It's fantastic. It was a great conversation. Well, and yeah, yeah, and he was such a fun person to talk to. He had just the best answers to our questions. It was was really great. Uh, Very professional. Very professional. It was an interesting drink choice he brought to uh, to the table. Sugar milk. Sugar milk. Yeah, which was uh, extremely nostalgic to me. I don't know what it was like for you. It was weird. Yeah, so it but was, it was good. It just, I, it was not something I was used to drinking. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was really nostalgic to me because I've actually lived in Japan, and he, I, I think his recipe came from his experience mm. uh, from where he is, and and, and uh, where he is in or from in Japan. Yeah. That's awesome. Should we just get right into it? Yeah, absolutely. All right, quick break. On the other side, you'll hear our conversation with Colin. Hey, I'm John. I'm one of the partners here at Grassfire Creative. We are a production company. We do animation, video production, live production, anything you need to creatively tell both your story and your business's story. Along with the content that we create, we also provide the strategy behind how to get it in front of the eyeballs that matter to you. We're located right in the middle of the United States in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so no matter where you are, we're just a short flight away. Bottom line is, we are very excited to both meet you and tell your business a story. Please do reach out to us one of the ways below via email or phone number and check out more about us at our website, grassfirecreative.com. Welcome back to The Tasting Room. I'm Austin McRoy here with... John Moss. And thank you for listening. We have one of our guests here today, Colin Sato. Thank you Welcome for having me. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. What's going on, big guy? Nothing much. Just uh, at the end of the day of meetings, and I think about to drink quite a few interesting things. We are. So here's the question. I brought a barrel pick of Bullet Bourbon. Austin brought tons of beers. Oktoberfest and Miss Stoutfire. What did you bring? I brought sugar milk, <laughs> right so-called <on>. by me. <laughs> and how did you come up with this contraption? Well, one day, <laughs> in kitchens you often need caffeine, and so I was in the habit of making a kind of coffee, using instant coffee. One day we were out of it, out of the coffee, so I just mixed sugar and milk, and the kitchen was so disgusted that I just leaned into it and called it sugar milk. So even when the coffee came back and I had the things to make what is essentially like a, I don't know, just like a latte, I still call it sugar milk and they all hate it. They secretly <laughs> like it. They know that it tastes good, but they love to hate it. So a, I had to bring uh, it. Chef, chef special. Yes. Exactly. That's hard to say. It is hard to exactly. say. Yeah, I, I went first. Right okay. Well, let's, so we'll, the, we'll uh, the sugar early. milk will be the pickup in the middle. We'll oh, yeah. Um, So, Colin, tell people where you are right now. I I mean, we know how we got to know each other, but uh, tell people that don't know where you are. Yeah. So, um, I cook together with a team at um, Vintage Wine Bar, uh, which is downtown, kind of by McNelly's, where El Guapo used to be. Um, We cook together Tuesday through Saturday. I think of that as kind of like our group project, I guess. We all contribute. It's eight of us in the kitchen. We all contribute to every menu. Um, we also have some like personal concepts, which is where I met John. Um, mine is called Natsukashi, which is like the Japanese word for nostalgia. So I cook homestyle um, Japanese food. Um, and then others on the team, like Brad has Elisi, which is like Cherokee food. Uh, Marco cooks modern Mexican food under the label Tres Nidos. But yeah, we sort of have all these different projects and, and vintage is where we are day to day. And if you're listening and not watching, you, you can't see the shirt he's wearing, but that is, that is his logo for the Natsukashi. Yes. 
Uh, I'm just excited to actually host a uh, a podcast that is going to bring in people that are making interesting things. Yes. Uh, because yes. Uh, I didn't know that you were focusing on Japanese food mm -hmm. at Vintage, and that makes me really excited. I actually <clears throat> um, lived in Japan for a year and a half with oh, my wife, yeah. so where, where I in Japan? have to go down there. Yeah, where in Japan? Uh, just north of Tokyo in Mitoshi. Okay. I'd never been there, but that's right awesome. Yeah, my family's from Kobe. So before oh, we okay. open up our uh, six-pack of questions, cheers. Thanks cheers, for coming guys. on, Colin. Cheers. Uh, so you. this, uh, tell me how you think it is first before I... I tell you. And is this straight up bullet? Oh, it's single so it's barrel. A, it's a single barrel. It's a pick from the bourbon group that I'm in. So they picked the barrel. Right on. It has Mark Davis's beautiful mullet on the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Right. Uh, the picture, if you, if you you can't see it, but it is wonderful. There you go. I think it's pretty smooth for being uh, 104 proof. Ooh. Not quite the 116.4 that we had last time. Yeah, yeah. a couple delicious. times ago. But. I don't know anything about bourbon, but that is tasty. No. It is very, very good. Uh, for anybody that doesn't really know how to start to drink bourbon, um, one of the smarter things to get your palate and your nose and your brain ready to drink it is actually breathe in the aromas mm -hmm. through your mouth first. Um, and that's going to be a mouth remove, breather. Yeah, remove the shock um, of the harsh alcohols mm -hmm. and make the drink smoother. Look at that. You're learning something. I am. That would explain why I always can like <laughs> struggle with bourbon. Every yeah, other there you go. Alcohol. Well, we are humans and we, I mean, alcohol is poison. So your brain, it's very when, true. You, when you put it in your mouth first, your brain says, oh my goodness, you're poisoning me. And that's why your, your body is shocked hmm. at first. And then that's why the second and third sip of the alcohol is actually the true, easier yeah. and smoother. And that's why you can't just have one sip of bourbon and actually get a true reasoning yeah. of what it tastes like. Hmm. So I'll go first for the questions for Colin, because you mentioned palate, and that was one of my questions. Your food is very unique mm -hmm. in the flavor profile. Um, how have you seen Tulsa as a city, the palate, be receptive to what you cook, and, and have you sensed it changing since you kind of took over and, and started doing what you're doing? Yeah, so that's a good question. First of all, I have actually had a, a ton of very surprising moments where I would cook some food just because I was feeling a little courageous that day that I was like, surely Americans will hate this. Um, <laughs> what's, a, what's an example of something that like, you thought um, Americans would hate? Turnip pickles, they are like, uh, they're just a, they're a fermented pickle, so it's just salt and turnips. It's bitter, it's kind of astringent. It does, basically, it doesn't taste like anything that I think of like American people as liking. Um, and like when we would eat that for family meal, like at Vintage during the time we were doing this uh, Japanese dinner, people like really enjoyed it. And I was like, oh, this is this is what I thought people would hate the most, and people actually like really enjoy it. Um, In the Japanese uh, culture, is that used as a palate cleanser or? Sort of both. So like, I actually think part of what makes Japanese food really smart is that. Like in some Western cultures, like a palate cleanser is like a course, you know, like you have a little sorbet, you have a little whatever that's supposed to like cleanse your palate. Whereas in a lot of Japanese food, it's sort of built in. It's like a part of your meal is making sure that you get to cleanse your palate often mm. enough. So like the short answer is yes, like bitterness helps cleanse the fat or salt. The acid helps clear away just like overall intensity of stuff. Um, but like it's not like they give you a thing of pickles in the middle of the meal. It's just part of the meal, and it's understood that you'll make, like, you'll, you'll take what you need for your palate to feel good, basically, during the meal. Um, but overall, yeah, it's been amazing, actually. People have been, um, like, extremely receptive to it. I know it's a kind of food that doesn't exist otherwise in Tulsa. Like, Japanese food usually means, like, sushi or mm -hmm. ramen, which there's nothing wrong with that. Those are both, like, whoop, sorry. those We're are good. both, like, amazing, amazing genres of food. But this kind of home style, like, there's a reason it appeals to everyone, because, like, Japanese children love it. Japanese elderly people love it. It's like the food that everyone eats, so it has to be kind of mm -hmm. widely, um, widely lovable. But yeah, it's been amazing. Like people now, like karaage, Japanese fried chicken. That's is, my jam right there. It's like a I thing that, that people like 
I mean, basically just like white people be like, oh man, where's that karaage? I'm like, that's amazing that you know the word <laughs> for what it is and you like it enough to know it's like a different thing. You and know? you sell and out quick like, when you do that, like at heirloom or when you do pop-ups just with the fried chicken. Like I've tried to come after work and you're already out. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, shit. yeah. 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 <laughs> well, the word's out. And one of the cool things like the, for this podcast to actually exemplify the community of Tulsa specifically uh, we're receptive to a lot of weird things, mm-hmm. which is really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree uh, with that. Do you are you ever going to do any kind of Japanese breakfast? I'm glad you asked. Um, yeah, so this is one of the things we're uh, building into like a monthly thing. Actually, I've never spoken to you personally about it, but uh, about once a month now at Vintage we do Japanese breakfast. So it's the full. There's like several kinds of pickles, homemade miso soup, shiozake, which is like half cured salmon. That's like a big spread. It's like eight or nine dishes that are a kind of elaborated version of what I actually used to eat growing up. It was always like rice pickles, miso soup, yep. and then some some other thing. So we just do a kind of like fun, cool version. But man, when I moved to Japan, uh, Japanese breakfast really turned me off at first. Oh really? Wow. Yeah, I I did not like it because the smell of fish was so strong especially really like morning. if you're walking down the alleyways like uh of let's say uh kyoto or something like that mm-hmm. uh your our brains our western brains are saying oh goodness I, I need this i need yeah. to smell coffee and Where's syrup the bacon? and waffles yeah. and yeah. bacon and all i'm smelling is really really yeah. intense fish yeah, fish fermented soy sour yeah, oh yeah. my goodness it's so intense yeah uh, and then i would say probably six months into living there i started really craving it so i haven't had a traditional japanese meal since oh my I've god left. october 24th there you go vintage it's on my it's october on my 24th we'll drop one week before the 17th you'll see the marketing come out you should come. That's awesome. Right on. It is. Well, be tasty. that wasn't my first question, <laughs> sure. uh, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, so all y'all listening out there, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're doing on this podcast, John said that we have a six pack of questions. We are going to uh, ask six different questions of our, our guests and let them run with it. There you go. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so my first question is, how did you start your journey? Um, and tell us a little bit of how you became a chef, um, and tell us a little bit about yourself other than what you've already said. Sure. Um, so it's actually one of those funny situations where like being a cook was kind of, it was always my dream Mm. when I was a kid. Like some of my first memories are, um, like doing make-believe food. Moose was what I always thought I was cooking, like moose pies, <laughs> moose barbecue, whatever. Um, like the animal. The animal. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Not like the fluffy so, chocolate dessert. Yeah, but no. The, the At animal. that time, yeah. I had like a bunch of Beanie Babies, and I was always cooking some sort of <laughs> moose cuisine. We'll see if it ever comes full circle. I'm sure. For some, the Beanie Babies? Huh? Is that who you were cooking for? for uh, the Beanie sometimes babies? I was cooking yeah. it for them, and sometimes I was cooking like with them, like they were the ingredients. At least you but, weren't cooking them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I was like from my earliest memories, those were like my make believe things. Was cook- I mean, there was other stuff too, but I was always cooking stuff. Um, I was always like obsessed with food. Like looking back, all the things I liked, like all the books I liked. I didn't realize at that time, but like Sanji and the Baker, and I forget this name of this one book, it's like a mouse that smells cheese and helps a cheese fat. Like all my books that I liked were about food. All the things I did that were make-believe were about food. And I pretty much was that way. I got obsessed with the Food Network when I was like 10. We weren't supposed to like watch TV until, like, so I was homeschooled. We weren't supposed to watch TV until three o'clock when like normal people could watch TV. Um, but I would like secretly every day go in the guest room and shut the door and watch Food Network for like eight hours for like a couple of years. Um, so I was always obsessed with it. Once I got to high school, I discovered like everything else because I went to like a public high school. So I was like, wow, physics is great. Math is great. And I like did a detour of like 10 years of just getting into everything else. Mm. I have degrees in like math and physics and writing and all this stuff. And then I taught. And then when I was leaving my last teaching job, I was like, I don't want to be that person who never really tried to like do their dream basically that's awesome um so yeah i left teaching and i showed up um at orin restaurant um on brookside matt's great yeah really good guy food's really good there 
Um, and uh, yeah, basically, I just showed up like when I knew other cooks wouldn't be there, and I was like, please give me a job, I'll do anything. I have no experience. I'd never worked in restaurants, I'd never been, I'd never worked in a restaurant or in the food industry at all, mm. but I was like, please give me a job, I will do anything, I will whatever. Uh, and he did, and that was my start. And then, yeah, I mean, pretty much since then, it's just like, I think it's, the good thing is, if you're ob obsessed that way, it's not like it's the only thing I do, but it's like always on my mental to-do list. Yeah. Like, oh, I'd like to read a cookbook. I want to cook something. I want to have people over. And yeah, so just all throughout it, you know, I've been growing and, but yeah. So that's sort of the beginning of the story is like, I was uh, obsessed with food. Then I went to high school, became a teacher. I taught like math and computer programming. And then food was like, I want to try to do my dream. And now it actually like turns out pretty decent at it and really like it. Like it's a fun, happy life. So yeah, that's how I got where I am. My second question ties into your answer there because I was wondering what do you think it was about food that attracted you to it so early? That, well, okay, so part of it is that my family, so like my mom is sort of like every kind of white thing and some little bit of uh, Chinese. Her mom is half Chinese mm -hmm. and like food is like what you do and are in Chinese culture. It's like all you're doing is like thinking about food. And then my dad is Japanese. So I would say I grew up and they're like the same way. Like food is such a big part of your life. So I would say it's kind of like people maybe who grew up with a lot of like music in their house. You sort of take it for granted that like a lot of the fabric of your life is built around like what are you going to eat? When are you going to cook it? Yeah. Who's going to be there to eat it? Like bringing people together. Um, that's definitely one thing is it was just assumed like we, ate di we actually did eat dinner together as a family pretty much every single day like home-cooked food like every day. That's which awesome. I learned later Nowadays, in my life. Nowadays that does not happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I learned yeah. later in my life that's like very rare. Um, and then I think the other side, I actually don't know what it is that makes me like this, but I'm particularly drawn to foods or really anything where it's like you take something relatively simple and cheap and you make it into something really worthwhile. So like my projects before I did food as like my life, was like bread, right? It's like really cheap ingredients mm. that if you know what you're doing, you can make it great. Like caramel, it's like basically simple stuff, but you have to know exactly how far to cook it to make it good. Um, croissants, I used to make croissants for Cirque. That was like my first project ever, like selling food, kind of illegally, but whatever. Um, <laughs> no one's watching that could get you in trouble for yeah, that. Yeah, no. <laughs> not doing it anymore. But anyway, so Statue those- your limitations have expired. You're so good. those, um, for some reason, that dynamic of like, um, sort of developing expertise that just lives in your head or in your body that allows you to like transform things. I think I've always been drawn to that dynamic. Like I started learning how to draw and that's the same thing. It's like just the pencil and paper, but if you have enough like mental infrastructure, mm. you know, you can make something cool out of it. So yeah, I'd say those are the two things. Right on. Well, do you want to dive into the second drink? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> right on. We're just going to move down the line. You're up. So what are we going with? Oktoberfest? Yeah, yeah. We do not want to go into Stoutfire just yet. Okay, fair. We so, don't want to go bourbon to Stoutfire? You sure? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> the, fair, last, the last two questions will just be all of us asleep. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right on. So, okay. Uh, a little bit about this beer and one reason why. I just love that sound. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, guys. That's one of the happiest, happiest Cheers, boys. sounds on earth. Hey, don't leave me. Cheers. Come on now. Yeah. Uh, so... I definitely oh, that's want. really good. It is Thank really, really good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, what? I haven't had this. See, that's exactly. There was surprise in his voice when he said that, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, wow. This is really cool. good. Oh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> it has, like, a little, like, um, grape aroma. Like, um, oh, you get, like, yeah. a musk or, like, a, yeah. Almost like, um, I don't know what grape that is. Like, a really muted, like, muscat kind of mm. smell. That's awesome. That's uh, a chef's nose. Yeah, that that's is a chef's, chef's nose. nose. Yeah. I don't mm. know. I, I can definitely get it now. I've never gotten grape out of this beer, but I, d I definitely get all of that kind of honey malt character. Um, right. It's did definitely you guys a little bit. this already? Oh, yeah. I'm behind. I'm over here <laughs> listening <laughs> maybe, and talking. Maybe, yeah, maybe what, are you, you what are you doing? Focus. <laughs> what are you doing? Focusing on the conversation. Let's like <laughs> there. I caught yeah, up. Stay focused. Come on. I caught up. Uh, so one of the my favorite things about uh, fest beer is um, there are two different styles of fest beer. And they have a really rich history, if you guys don't know. Um, the original recipes that everyone, I would say, in America really understands what Oktoberfest to be mm -hmm. is the Marzen style. And that's the redder, more copper, a little bit more heavy caramel malt uh, body to it. 
And then there's the Festile that came around in the 1970s. And truly, the reason that um, this style and the style that we make at Cabin Boys uh, is the Fest beer, and I read it in a textbook, so I'm not making this up. Uh, they invented this style because the Germans said, well, the Marzen is too heavy, not enough alcohol, and we can't drink enough of it at Oktoberfest, so let's make a beer that is light, refreshing, and more alcoholic that we can drink faster so that we can party harder. <laughs> And that is literally I mean, what why? other explanation would you ever need <laughs> and as to why incredible. not to drink fest beer? And yeah, I would say the Germans are the only ones that would actually stick that into a brewing mm -hmm. textbook. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Maybe Austrians, but Germans yeah. and Austrians, yeah. So all of the listeners out there that don't know what a fest beer style is, it's lighter in color. It's more honey biscuit, maybe even grape, mm -hmm. uh, musk uh, forward beer that's mm -hmm. a lot crisper and easier to drink and a lot more festive because you can drink more of it. And it's a little bit more alcoholic. You have to be careful. This isn't my third question either, but just before we get to Austin's second question, you have to be careful. You can't drink while you work because you might cut a finger off or something, right? Yes, but also... No. I think cutting yourself <laughs> is like a... If you know what you're doing, I would say relatively low. Do you have all 10 digits? Risk. You good? I got all, yeah, okay. I've actually... Don't jinx yourself. It's Don't even the, say it. <laughs> not only I, I, I like negative jinx myself every day. I'll sometimes say as a joke when I'm, I kind of like moving fast. Mm. It's like one of my, I just like to be fast. I want to be like a good professional. Um, especially when I'm using a mandolin, I'll go extra Ooh, fast. Those are scary. Just because it, <laughs> it gives my co-chef Marco some anxiety because he's like, like there's two kinds of chefs, the ones that have had a bad accident on a mandolin and those who haven't. So I haven't still. So I do my best to like run on that edge. And you probably all the don't time. use a guard or anything. No, right? no yeah. guard yeah. as fast as possible. And like people who, yeah, put the guard on or they really slow down at the end. I just like living on the edge. So sometimes I'll be like, man, you got to hit the blade hard so it cuts real clean. And someday when I cut myself, it's gonna be a bloodbath. And Oof. they're like, oh god. But I still have never done it. I mean, I really have have made some terrible speed decisions, and I've come out all right so far. Good. So yeah. good. Good. All right, so sorry, listeners, I didn't memorize my question, so I'm just going to read it from a I'll give you a, I'll give you a, an interviewing tip that I've just, from years on TV, right? Yeah. I, I have one question in my head, and the other questions come from his answers. Wonderful. Yeah, so going forward, that way you don't have to memorize them. And it's flow of conversation. There we go. There we right go. On. Yeah. I do want this question to be answered. Do it. Uh, so... It was uh, when pairing wine or any alcoholic drink with food, Ooh. what is your goal when constructing that pairing? And would you have any kind of advice uh, for people out there listening that wouldn't really know where to start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will say this is a lucky thing because a lot of us in the kitchen are actually really into wine. Um, me and Marco were both studying for a CSW, which is like a wine exam. And you just happen to work at Vintage. I happen to work it's at great. Vintage. Yeah, it's nice when you have like $100,000 yeah. of wine sitting right, around. Right. Um, okay, well, so the first thing would be like that uh, when I was first sort of learning about wine, I had this like anxiety in my head that was like for every dish, there's one perfect wine and I probably won't get it. Mm. And I have realized since then that although there are a few kind of pairings that are like super classics, like I forget whether it's port or sherry because I don't drink fortified wines that often, but like blue cheese with some specific wine may be like this amazing pairing. Like they have some um, super strong relationship. But in general, it's like if you're drinking kind of light, you know, light, fresh, summery food, then try to drink like a light, fresh, summery wine, which is to say, like, it's not so heavy, it's not incredibly alcoholic, right. it's not some super heavy red. So that was the first thing. That got me out a lot of, like, mental cluster F. So you're saying, like, like, don't drink a Zin with a fruit salad. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, go I'm... Go Chardonnay, go Sauvignon Blanc or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. The first thing is just, like, don't worry too much about it. Just don't get the absolute wrong thing. Like, if you're eating fish, you should probably drink what white wine if you're drinking or if you're eating steak probably drink red wine like you're already well into doing it well there um and i guess the other thing is like 
I sometimes think about wine as like a sauce. Like it's 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 acidic. Mm. It's more acidic. It's acidic rather than basic. So that means that when you eat it with things that are a little richer or a little fattier, it will just kind of naturally always taste good. So I mean, honestly, for my own part, it's like there's some deeper stuff where certain wines. Well, you guys know this, but certain wines, you know, smell like certain stuff. Yeah. Um, like Gruner Veltliner kind of smells like green beans or vegetables. So if you're getting real geeky about it, yeah, if you have a very vegetable tasting dish, get Gruner Veltliner. That's getting way into the weeds, though. But in general, if you're having like light vegetable food, then get sort of lighter white wines is my sort of thing. So honestly, like mostly my solution is like, don't worry so much about it unless you're really into it. Like if it makes you happy to know that Grenache and Syrah smell kind of like pepper, so they go well with peppery Mm. stuff. Unless that gives you joy, just know that heavier stuff should go with heavier wines. Lighter stuff should go with lighter wines. Or same thing with beer or cocktails. Um, But yeah, I try not to get too, like, crazy about, you know, telling people, oh, we've made the one perfect pairing. It's like, no, you didn't. Like, you just had all this (laughs) wine around. and you Don't lie. Yeah, you had all this wine around, and you picked a one that was very sensible and good, and it's going to taste great. Like, the food will taste better. The wine will taste better. But it's not, like, some pairing sent by God. It's just, like... You know, right. Yeah, it's like drinking cold things during the summer. It's not like a, some me- miracle that that's good. It's just you like, yeah, I'm too hot. That. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think right. this is a good time to bring up the fact that, A, we're learning a lot as we sit here with Colin. B, he talked about his background as a teacher. So naturally, you're rolling out your first cooking class that I've been seeing online. So I'll, I'll be sure to get this podcast up before the registration closes. Yes. So talk about it a little bit and what you're doing. And that's not really my question, but I felt like that's a good time yeah. as we're talking yeah. through this. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, well, first of all, thank you for bringing that up. Mm-hmm. I'm not always the best at giving a shameless plug, but um, yeah, basically I part of like leading a team as a chef. So like we all work pretty co-equally, um, but at the same time, like, I was the first one at Vintage, and then Marco came on. Like, basically, we've, like, trained a lot of cooks. And in that process, combined with me being a teacher, I was, like, really figuring out how food works, basically. Like, you can't teach something you don't actually know. And so, yeah, just actually was this two, three days ago, um, I, like, published this course that I've been working on for, I guess, like, a year and a half, I guess, which is, like... Well, it's called How to Actually Cook. The website is, I love that name. The, yeah. the website is howtoactuallycook.com. I was talking to my roommate. It used For a while, I was calling it Cooking Concepts. He was like, but I mean, what is the course about? I was like, I mean, it's like how to actually cook. Not like all the bullshit of just like, here's a little recipe. Here's how to make it easier. It's like real cooks are people who just know a few things, and that's how they do their job. Um, so I called it How to Actually Cook. So yeah, I've just started sort of marketing this. It's like a six-week course. Um, every week is focused around like a big idea. One is like balancing the palate. One is flavor affinities. One is recipes as ratios by weight. Sort of each week we cook together on one day and we do like a little, whatever, learning happy hour on the other Fridays and Mondays. Um, and yeah, I mean, I actually think people who take it will actually know how to cook. That's like actually the big difference. It's like you can watch Thomas Keller teaching you how to make this amazing stuff. You can watch Nikki Nakayama from Ennaka. Like all that stuff is amazing. But I will say, I think if I took that course because I know how to cook, I will get a lot out of it. I think if just some random person on the street takes that course, they will basically not be able to do any of those things. And it's not mostly stuff in the hands. It's just like ideas in your head. Like one of them is like salt is the most important. Way more important than any other seasoning. Um... So yeah, that's like, it's a virtual course basically over Zoom. It's like a little less than half full right now. My goal is to have between like 10 and 16 students. Mm. And I had my first signups uh, yesterday. So yeah, if you're interested in learning how to cook, it's- So would you say it's for, like, I know how to cook and Mm -hmm. I I fashion myself and call myself a foodie. Like I I appreciate and understand what went into good food, right? And I love cooking at home kind of more towards the barbecue side. I have some smokers out back. Oh, but cool. I, I just do whatever. Like, I'm, I'm decent in mm-hmm, the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Would the class be more for someone like me who has an intermediate knowledge of how to cook, or would it be more for someone, I'm not going to say like Austin, because I don't know if you can cook or not. Yeah. I cannot. Okay. I think, so, okay. Would I, think be, my, <laughs> I think my wife would really want me yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. take yeah. this course because yeah, that's what I should be like, doing. You want, you want to uh, come help me yeah. cook? Yeah, I like, should be like, absolutely. So I should be like, I'd be like, ladies, yeah. here's the gift for your husband yes. or boyfriend, which is 
mostly a joke, although also ladies. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. So, so what's okay. Your target market? I would say I would say both for different reasons. So if you don't know how to cook at all, it will seem to everyone you know that just suddenly all your food tastes good, even though it's kind of like basic food. Like the recipes we learn how to cook are not like fucking beef Wellington or Thank some God. elaborate yeah. multi-course meal. It's no, like no one really even wants to eat that. Stuff. Thank you. Thank it you. just looks pretty on Instagram. That's yeah, all it exactly. is. Yeah, exactly. Um, you do it for the gram, Austin. Hey, I'm sorry for everybody out there that grams. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lisa runs your gram. She does, thankfully. <laughs> Incredible. That's how he's made it this far. Yeah, right. Yeah, I quit that. And Jane smart, <laughs> smart man. Um, okay, so basically for a beginner, you would take the course and anyone who eats your food, like either people you live with or if you had people over, all of a sudden it would seem like, wait, you're like making like basic food, but it tastes so good. Mm. Like this is actually a big misconception that people think they want to eat beef Wellington when really what they want to eat is like pasta with red sauce where it just actually tastes good. Like, like yeah. I think we've all had those experiences where it's like very simple food, but somehow it's just hitting so hard. That for me, like in our kitchen and also for myself personally, that is what being a good professional, or well, not a good professional because you're at home, but like being an actually good cook means you can make like chicken thighs with salt mm. and it will taste right. better than almost any protein you can have anywhere else. That is like the, it's like what I, it's going back to what I said before. It's like, I like to take simple things and like take them to a very high level. So if you don't know how to cook, that's how it'll function. You'll be like, oh, wow. So I'm just taking like, you know, a steak and putting salt on it. And then I know what to do to it and it will taste perfect, like amazing, like better than a steakhouse. Um, so that's how it would be if you don't. And then for people who sort of do know how to cook, you're like interested in it. Um, or like this was my experience because I was one of those ones I would say who I loved to cook, but it was like a miracle every time mm -hmm. it came out well, you know? I was like, oh my God, it came out well again. Amazing. But I didn't understand why. Like I couldn't guarantee right. that the next time. I think if you are in that place where you like to cook or you're already pretty decent at cooking, what it will do is like, it's like turning the light on in the room, you know? Like yeah. you felt around different place. Oh, okay, so this is something. I don't know what this is. Okay, there's another thing. And then you turn the light on and the whole space is illuminated. That's the sort of idea. Like balancing the palate, just knowing what things actually affect if something tastes good on your palate, as opposed to like in your nose, there's really only like five, kind of six, if you include fat. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like fish mm. sauce and soy sauce, you're like, oh, it's like fishy soy sauce. But you don't see them as these crazy, like secret ingredients don't really exist. Right. There's another example of that. So for those who are intermediate or like pretty good cooks, unless you have to think about it a lot professionally, I don't know why a person would ever go this deep into it. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's like, oh, wow. So yeah. this explains why all these things taste good. It's like, yeah. And now you can do it for yourself, like whatever you make. So I would say both. And I'll throw a disclaimer out there. I, I'm lucky enough to have some really good chefs as really close friends, Trevor Tack, Trey Winkle. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, Colin, like, really good I don't guys. know if you noticed, but one of the first times I met you when I was sitting at the counter at Solera, I was picking your brain about ingredients and like how you mm -hmm. were doing certain things. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Trey and Trevor just spending time, like <laughs> Trey would come over into my kitchen and we would drink beer and we would drink too much beer. And then he would just start to be like, all right, let's play a game. And he would open my refrigerator and open my pantry and be like, all right, what do you want to make? I'm like, well, I don't have anything. I haven't gone to the store. He's like, no, bullshit. Like, look, you have this, 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 and this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you do this with this. So, like, it, it turned me into a foodie. Because, and I feel like your class will do this to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Because you didn't realize, <clears throat> like, I make a better omelet at home than I can get at any restaurant yeah, yeah, yeah. in the city. I make a better steak and better barbecue at home, no offense to Burnco and other places, sure. than I can go get anywhere else in the city just because I know the simple building blocks of how to layer flavor and, and how to do things right, which yeah. I, I think is what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. And like that's what you want to share with people. Yeah. And that's a great thing to yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a great example for my light bulb that uh, just happened recently. My wife was like, hey, can you make the uh, vinaigrette for the salad for our family birthday party? And I was like, did you have to Google I how can, to make a vinaigrette? I, can, I could, <laughs> sure, yeah, I can do that. And she was like, just grab the oil, the vinaigrette, some oregano, lemon juice, and honey, mix it together, shake it, taste it. Yeah. And I was like, that's it? <laughs> really? I love that, I love that. And yeah. I did it, 
without her actually telling me the volumes. I'm a brewer, so I kind of right. can... Yeah, you have a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a sense of, you know, some things, you know, oil, acid, combinations, sweetness with honey, and this, that, and the other, and shook it up, put it on the salad, or tasted it, and I was like... It tastes great. Wow, that yeah. was really I can cook. easy. <laughs> yeah. And a, li- a light bulb, like you're talking about, a light bulb came on, and and then I said, I, I asked her, I was like, why why do people actually buy this buy in the dressings. store? Yeah. And she was like, oh, no, you shouldn't. Yeah. Because they always eat. taste worse at the store. Yeah. Right. And, and you don't know what else is in it. Mm-hmm. This and, is and, half and the problem. They've probably got a lot of different bad sugars. In yeah, it. that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah you, you don't know. Um, if you're making it at home, <clears throat> it's wholesome, usually wholesome ingredients that you know what they are. Right. You start reading, and that's the one thing I wish I would have, on one hand, I wish I would have never learned to do, but now I can't undo it, is <clears throat> when you look at ingredient like oh, labels yeah. and you're like, Oh, what the yeah. fuck is that? Like, yeah. Yeah. If you're going to, if you're like, going to make something that has five ingredients and you yeah. buy it and it has 30, right. Like, well, why did you need to add the, yeah. Cause sometimes they taste terrible. Yeah. They often do. 